what are some of the cool clients that you've um, that you've had? What, what are some of the brands that you've worked on? Has there been like a favourite campaign that you've run? Well, I was thinking about the current client base, uh, Rugby League World Cup is one of our Pretty better cool. known clients, shall I say. Um, one of the biggest uh, sporting events in the UK this year. Um, it, there's four key city locations, one of which is Newcastle, which is great. Yeah. Big weekend planned for the launch weekend in Newcastle because it's England Samoa as the first game on October the 15th. And we expect from the information we have to hand that it's going to be very similar to like the Great North Run weekend. So there's like so much going on in the city, lots down the quayside. So I'm really looking forward to that moment of being like watching that game, being in the stadium, being like, oh my God, like we've helped create this. Yeah. What's up, Wanderers, and welcome to the Beat the Scroll podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Chloe Clover, and this podcast is the content creators podcast, all about marketing, video, content, all of that goodness, anything that is creative, we absolutely, we absolutely love it. I happen to be a bit of a nerd myself for all things content and creation, so that's how this thing started, and it's a beautiful thing, but most the thing that I, I'm most excited about is this episode. <laughs> I'm really excited. Uh, I'm here with Stephen Underwood um, from Bonded Agency, but from all sorts of other things as well. Um, you a pretty special guy doing pretty special things. Oh, thanks, Chloe. Hey. That means a lot to be introduced <laughs> like that. Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. Very pleased to be here. Super chuffed that you invited me on. Um, down in Middlesbrough, in the studio, in the new um, Wonder Films home as well. I know, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is like, I think this is the second pod I've done in the, in mm-hmm. our new space, so it feels feels pretty special. And you came um, branded as well. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I do my best. <laughs> yeah. I took my time over my outfit today, so, you know. <laughs> it looks really good. So you've been you've been in agency in the world of creative and marketing for, for a really long time. You, you've got so much experience. Um, guess I'm super curious about your journey like how did it how uh-huh. did it all begin wow okay um depends how far you want to go back I guess <laughs> but um it's interesting actually because I did a I did a talk to Newcastle College uh, last week and I talked specifically through this and did a bit of presentation um and I really enjoyed the process of putting that together because it sort of took me back through the journey yeah and to be honest like coming from school uh, and going to university as I did which is why I ended up in Newcastle in the North East because as you may be able to tell I, I've not picked up the Geordie uh, twang quite yet and uh, I'm actually from the North West and I'm South Manchester um, so I came up to uni and I just did like geography because I didn't have a break in between school and university mm-hmm. uh, it was my best A level subject I had no real idea as to what I wanted to do for a career at that point yeah. um, but what I was really interested in was music and um Back then, like, you know, DJing, like DJing at home wasn't like as big as it is now. Yeah. Uh, But I had some decks. I didn't even bring them to university, to be honest. And then I sort of made friends with people who were into similar music as me in the straight away in the first term. And, you know, first trip back home, brought the decks back up. Um, And uh, one thing led to another. And we started putting on um, music events uh, properly in my second year at uni. That's cool. And uh, yeah, it grew. It was like uh, drum and bass uh, music. I was just going to ask you what it was. Yeah. It was drum and bass. Yeah. And it was a night called Turbulence that some of your listeners, um, depending on their age, may have been to. Um, (laughs) And uh, yeah, you know, super proud. We ran it for 15 years as as what's termed, I guess, a side hustle nowadays. Um, It was always (laughs) a part time thing um, done alongside the studies and then, you know, alongside uh, career when you know went into it but the, the reason I mention all that is because even when I finished my undergrad in geography I like looked at myself and I was like I still no idea really what I want to do yeah um so I sort of thought about it and I thought well what do I enjoy doing and it was like well I enjoy doing these music events and mm-hmm. I was like why do I enjoy that and it was like the marketing and promotion of them right okay that makes sense yeah um uh, so yeah, mass- so went on to do a master's in marketing at Northumbria, and uh, really, really enjoyed that. Like through that process of a year's course, like definitely was like, yeah, I want to get into this. Yeah, um, and I was very much uh, attuned to the option of going in agency rather than in house. It was just my personal preference, and I've never really changed that viewpoint as to why I wanted to go that way. Um, 
I wasn't able to get a job in an agency straight away, but after a year I did, and that really started the journey for me, and mm. that was back in 2003, so, you know, approaching sort of 20 years <laughs> agency <laughs> side. It's, uh, Two decades, that's I know. crazy. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, as director and independent uh, for 10 years, and then mm. um, I went into the other end of the scale, uh, global network agency, yeah. uh, 110 countries, employing 50,000 people across the world. So, you know, really big entity. Mm -hmm. And then um, since then, I, I left that organisation and set up Bonded, which is um, approaching 12 months ago now. So, yeah. Yeah, and already making like massive waves as well. But that just, but it, it was a, a collective, wasn't it? That you guys came together and, and decided you, you really wanted to do this new thing. Uh huh, absolutely. Um, so there was four founders of the business, all ex global agency. Uh, extensive XWPP background. Um, so, you know, good, really good, strong foundation from a proposition perspective, you know, mm -hmm. all sort of trained and experienced at, at working with the big global brands as well as sort of startups right through, to be honest. But, uh, and each with a similar level of experience, you know, that sort of 15 years plus. Um, so, yeah, good starting point, really. In what is like, you know, it's a really competitive market. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, really exciting market I think um, you know back when I started not to make myself sound too old <laughs> but the internet I mean certainly digital agencies um, there weren't compared to today that mm -hmm. many about um, yeah. it was a relatively new thing most agencies were more traditional at that point um, you know, fast forward to today I and mean, we went in with our eyes open starting bonded but you know there's tens of thousands of agencies in yeah. the UK so we were keen to establish the reason why we exist and and um, I'm sure we'll come on to that later. But yeah. yeah, definitely. I, I think it's a, that's a really interesting start as well through music, um, and it, it, it's it's similar with with Lou and I. We we actually met in, in a band. Mm -hmm. So Lou's a really good guitarist, and I'm like a an average drummer. <laughs> and they were looking for a drummer, wow. so I joined. Um, uh, I I joined the band, and that's how that's how we met. I think. God, it was I joined on the Monday and I think on the Friday we were supporting uh, the Human League so like it was wow. like it was a I, there was a lot of work to be done there but whilst we were in that as well Lou and I started like a um a small events mm -hmm. company and it and it was and we were promoting the band and we were um putting gigs on in different places and stuff like that so that sort of uh, it's interesting that you say that that was something that inspired you because um, it, it was similar with us that we found with music like because um, we had a background in television and film and stuff like that but in music it was the it was it was the promotion of the band and building the hype and, uh, and and starting like a bit of a scene and a movement that that's what we really enjoyed doing um, and the culture I suppose and I think that sort of uh, translates over to to what we do now so i can 100 mm -hmm. relate right. with that so the, so you um so you went in a in a agency and in, in big agency and like you said that you had the choice but or you it was either in-house or it was agency like and you said that you know you you definitely wanted to do that like why why was that um i mean uh, rightly or wrongly I, I i guess from a uh the type of marketing that uh, we deliver that, that, that I'm involved with um, you know that, that is a choice I guess within a career span is and, and particularly you know um, when I was starting off and you're thinking you know you're presented with different options uh, when you're starting to work and things um, it was always the route I wanted to go um, the, the reason for that was it was presented in a way that you know um, it's more that you get a variety of sure. working with different clients yeah, and um, it's more sort of pure marketing you know whether that's true or not uh, versus uh, perhaps more um, administrative duties and corporate based duties or whatever type of in-house role you might have I mean you know I, I think the times have moved on a little bit in the last 20 years and I know working with clients how mm -hmm. challenging their jobs are and how varied their jobs can be but um, I, I've always enjoyed helping other companies uh with their objectives and usually there to like grow for yeah. instance or achieve whatever kpis they want to and that that really that type of partnership that connection to help brands uh achieve what they need to achieve is is really what you know stands out for me and that's what i enjoy really yeah i, I again like i get that completely um because it's i think uh, and, and i think it's the it is it's the variety it's the, it every day's 
different in in agency and there's new campaigns coming in new projects new clients and and it keeps it really fresh so yeah I can I can totally I can totally relate to that I I think um it's so different how that approach as well is so different to um something that you're working on continuously and then something that is uh that's I don't know because I suppose you have long-term clients as well don't you where you are sort of working on it continuously but I guess it's the freshness of different campaigns and stuff and um and like you said supporting other businesses is is exciting have you ever found that there was like um that you had a niche or there was like an area that you were um particularly you particularly enjoyed or found yourself in in terms of agency work or agency yeah work. so in terms of like the the clients or the campaigns that you work on or that you run was there anything that you guys uh, or you in particular like felt um drawn towards a little bit more or that you you did more of um that's a really interesting question i think uh having thought about this for setting up bonded mm-hmm. um quite a broad answer but it's more that consultative approach um when we looked at how we were going to set up and create our proposition you know what really interests us is that like connection to brands to really get under the skin of how we can help them strategically and consult with them before or alongside talking to them about specific channel activity that they might need delivering to help their business objectives so um what we didn't want to create was a business that was seen as like a siloed supplier that was good at what they did in in this sort of box over here but you know wasn't able to sit at the table and talk strategically with a client because you know with our level of experience Mm -hmm. and interest to be honest yeah that's where we wanted to be so we're trying to present position ourselves we haven't termed ourselves consultancy purposefully but there is definitely that element when we approach client work that we want to be partnering with them in that way and and talking on a on a connected level uh, about what we do so is that the bit that, that you enjoy the most Personally, y- yes, probably with the output, uh, the actual practicalities of, of what we do. Yeah. Uh, that connection really uh, interests me. I mean, I just like, personally, from my viewpoint, you know, the interpersonal nature of what we do. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people found it quite challenging during COVID when we were sort of all apart and, yeah, you know, absolutely. not in the office and not able to go out and see clients and so forth. Uh, and I, you know, learned a lot during that period about what I enjoy about what I do and you know um was quite reflective Mm -hmm. and that was certainly something that I learned that you know taking a standing back slightly from the scenario um you know that interpersonal connection um with with people I guess uh particularly in the work environment is is really important and what I enjoy and I, I get a lot of energy and enthusiasm from that so what um you mentioned uh that you learned a lot during lockdown and during in COVID, and I know that you you're really passionate about um, about mental health and, and those sorts of things. Uh, is the is that something that you found during COVID? Or is that something that you've always been passionate about talking about? Um, it's certainly something I'd suggest over the last five years. It's become increasingly apparent that uh, of the value that. I personally place on it um, and, and the importance. I think it's always been there, but it's just the realisation that, you know, this this is an important area and, and in terms of my priorities and what I place focus on it is one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, if I think about five years, possibly uh, one of the trigger points for that was when um, I started engaging in a movement called Red January. Yeah. Uh, I did that on a personal level initially uh, around sort of January 2017. Um, it's a national movement that now... Um, over 50,000 people take part in each year and it's about promoting the benefits of exercise for positive mental health at a time of year where typically people are are struggling a little bit sort of post Christmas and winter time dark nights and so forth Um, so so I engaged in that um, on a personal level and then with my team in my previous organisation for a few years and then 2021 we uh, pulled together a bit more of a wider community uh, in the Newcastle area um, mainly agency people not not solely that though and uh, we had about 170 people take part in a wow. challenge that we sort of just created ourselves <laughs> a few weeks before January um, and <laughs> we um, essentially set ourselves the challenge of completing the steps or, or doing the equivalent exercise that equated to um 
a, a journey in steps from Newcastle, UK to Newcastle, Australia. It's about ten and a half thousand miles. Um, wow! <laughs> and we did it. Uh, and to be honest, it was an amazing thing in 2021 because we were in lockdown and it was like really challenging time, particularly for not just assessing only agencies, but agencies for, for many reasons because yeah. of the, the sex or implications, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so to come together and be able to um, organically essentially offer a community platform that enable people to share uh, the ups and downs uh, over those weeks that we did it together because we actually went to Australia virtually um, and then <laughs> circumnavigated back round because wow. people were so into it. So we ended up doing 23,000 miles because we went like via Canada and a few other bits. So uh, we actually ended up completing the journey in March. Um, so that, that sort of first quarter um, of 2021, that was quite a rewarding initiative, but mainly rewarding for everyone or, or a number of people that took part. Yeah. can't speak for everyone. Um, and I know that because of the, the positive feedback we got, we had a LinkedIn group set up that people were posting in like multiple times a day, posting their photos. Media owners got involved. Lights of ITV sponsored like a weekly photo competition. We had uh, Twitter and Google uh, put forward competition prizes and all, all manner of things that just sort of came out of That's the incredible. organic process. Um, and then we ran it again this this year. We just went to Australia this time. Um, <laughs> just. <laughs> yeah. um, a similar, similar level of people. We actually had more people uh, take part this year, but it was slightly different because we weren't the same macro pressures around lockdown and so forth. Yeah. Um, but hugely positive. And, um, you know, from th- those types of initiatives, really, uh, that's where my sort of visibility through social media and so forth has, has, uh, has come to the forefront talking about you know mental health and well-being and and the importance um and to come back to the original question around uh you know lockdown and covid and so forth i think the implications on wider society around you know mental health and Mm -hmm. it's quite a complex area but um you know that really has even further prioritized uh the focus during that period particularly when you're sort of a leader or manager and you know um, you have responsibilities not just for yourself but other people mm-hmm. it makes you think about well you know if I'm to do my job effectively uh, both both in work and at home you know how do I do that to the best of my ability and support other people as well as myself yeah absolutely. so that's that was really important to me and uh, that that's why again reinforcing the importance of mental health and well-being and looking after people and being able to support them was something that I learned about myself and yeah is that something? Uh, is it something you feel passionate about because um, it was something that you'd experienced yourself or experienced other people struggle with, or was it just purely wanting to do something to help people? I think it was mainly the latter. Um, I, I'm not going to profess. I, I, you know, I've had some challenges like earlier in my career. I, I can certainly relate to some of the challenges that people have some of them because I think it's the different environment now for people young adults and and coming into the industry Mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the um, proliferation of social media and and some of the other implications that society has now you know back in 2003 um, there was MySpace I think don't quote (laughs) me on that but you know it certainly wasn't you know uh, social media certainly wasn't what it is today Uh, and the always on culture that we have certainly wasn't the same back then so, um, however, you know, I had the insecurities, the worries, the uh, perhaps anxieties around, um, you know, and the insecurities around, you know, uh, that, that many people have in, in similar positions today. Yeah. So, you know, I've not um, been immune to uh, mental health challenges. However, um, that I wouldn't say that's the main driver. I would say that, you know, seeing people around me struggle to differing levels all in their unique way yeah. feeling responsible particularly from a leadership perspective to be able to support those individuals understanding the pressures to an extent in our industry mm-hmm. you know um it's always in my view been the case that if you choose sort of an agency career it won't be the least stressful you know we're not we're not saving lives or anything but you know um the nature of the job is 
uh, sometimes quite demanding, which has its own stresses, and that and that's been yeah. there for you know decades in different forms. Is that working to? Do you think it's working to um, deadlines and life campaigns and those sorts of things? Do you think that's what adds to that pressure and that that anxiety, that stress potentially? I think so. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, um, and the demands from from the nature of that activity I'm trying not to say demands from clients I, I was but, just going to say <laughs> but, um, yeah <laughs> no, I, I, you know, um, but you know th- this is the reality of, of the work and it, it's not you know I actually really enjoy you know the uh, the challenge if you like of the of the job uh, but I'm yeah, also yeah likewise I do too yeah yeah. I don't think we would be doing it and, and you, you probably wouldn't have like uh, uh, set up again fresh mm-hmm. if you if you didn't have some uh, something in you that enjoyed mm-hmm. those challenges and and that 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 relate that that people because I think that's what it is, isn't it? It's that relationship with people, and I think that's what you were saying earlier as well. Is is that's what that's what you really enjoy, but sometimes that can be the thing that's really challenging. Definitely, yeah. Um, and it, it's hard, you know. Um, something I do have experience, consistent experience of, is, is seeing people coming into the industry. You know, say like graduates or, or mm-hmm. people earlier on or, or later on coming into the profession, and if they've not done the role before, uh, or if it's their first job, or you know they've not worked with clients before, uh, more often than not, it, it's quite a, a learning experience, you know, mm-hmm. which is completely understandable. And and those people need to be supported through that process. You know, it, it, I don't believe in just letting people sort of sink or swim. You know, you need to support them in a way that gives them the best chance to succeed. So, yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Uh, so you know, it, it all boils. It all sort of is part of it. Um, and if they're through that feeling anxious or having challenges with their mental health, or you know, and that's being part of that reason is because of the job they're doing. And I think as an employer, we have responsibilities to support them through that. That that's my view. I'm not suggesting everyone needs to share that, but that's my view. No, I, I yeah, I totally agree. I think the the, the approach to um, well being and mental health is is changed so much. And do you know what? It might it probably is like the catalyst from COVID actually, isn't it? Like that conversation just seems to be happening more and more now and more openly. And I think um, a lot of people are um, maybe protecting themselves a little bit more as well, like uh, protective over the time and, and their health more than they ever have been, which also I think is is a really good thing that's come out of something that was really, really terrible. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And uh, it's an interesting area. I think we're still learning as a society like what the implications of the last uh you know two years or so is going to be yeah uh in many areas but and i think probably mental health and well-being is one of those and i think there will be other influences around not to get too serious but you know there's lots going on isn't there around the economy and what that means for individuals and so yeah, forth so absolutely. we're probably not at the end of learning about what the implications are no. but um uh yeah you know that awareness that self-awareness i think that's got to be a positive thing uh, the awareness of employers the awareness of mm-hmm. and I think you know this is like a, a thing I think in marketing like I think my viewpoint and I can share why in recent weeks I've, I've progressed this viewpoint as well actually I believe we're quite progressive uh, as a as a sector um, particularly you know an agency world particularly in marketing mm-hmm. um, I think we have to be I think employers are being uh, pushed in that direction because of uh, the great resignation and, and the challenges that exist within uh, recruitment and retention of, yeah. of staff. And I think, you know, it's fair to say that employers have looked at it and even if they don't believe in uh, certain values that I believe in, they realise from a business perspective yeah. that, you know, uh, the the market has changed and is changing and, you know, there's implications for their teams and what that means. So, um, but I, I you know... Um, I put a post out on on LinkedIn recently about mental health. I'm going to go through all the details, but it was quite interesting. I had 180 comments on this post, and not everyone was in agreement. You know, there was some other. There was a bit of a trend between from an industry perspective, yeah, uh, as to some of the opposing views, particularly from more traditional sectors. Mm-hmm. And and I found this like a really positive experience because um, it opened my eyes around actually perhaps. Although I engage with a lot of people on a week by week basis, I believe you know through bonded, but also other things I'm involved in, 
um, I'm still probably operating in quite a bubble. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And most of the people that I speak to are probably like marketers or business people yeah. in our particular space as opposed to being exposed to other industries and people that operate in different cultures and so forth. Yeah. Um, so it's quite a, a sort of level of that, you know, to actually make me think and go, you know what, I, th- I thought I was exposed to a good uh, a range of viewpoints consistently week by week, but perhaps I'm not, yeah. you know, and perhaps I need to be a bit more open-minded when I think about these types of subjects. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think that's what happens when you... Um, open yourself up to expressing um, opinions or vulnerabilities or anything like that on social media like that you, you're essentially inviting a forum of people to, to share their experiences their ideas and probably challenge yours as well which it sounds like that's exactly what happened yeah yeah and to be honest it wasn't like necessarily challenging me it was just challenging the viewpoint yeah. um, which I know could be one and the same thing however it was nothing like uh, directive mm-hmm. uh, against me. It was just I disagree with the disagree with the viewpoint, which is cool. You know, I'm yeah. completely cool with that. And actually, as I say, I, I take a, a positive learning experience from it. Really, it was quite a, a positive process to go through. Yeah, to open my mind around that. Yeah. You've probably seen um, the the industry, uh, like the marketing industry, change quite a bit uh, over the years. Um, what do you think uh, how do you see social now like you you did what did you think when it first uh, sort of appeared did you register that this was a new thing or is it just sort of happened do you, do you know what yeah. I mean I'm curious to know someone who started then and worked through it you know yeah I mean social's an obvious statement I guess but when you look at the data it is probably one of the fastest moving areas in terms of innovation and development. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we do um, sort of a weekly update piece called Bonded Bite Size, which does track like developments within digital media of the different platforms, media owners and, and new things that are coming out. And week by week, um, at least 50% of the developments are through social platforms. Yeah. And, it, and it's a really fast moving area at the minute, Particu- particularly due to TikTok. You know, yeah, a lot of yeah. things are quite obvious, right? But, you know, a lot of the platforms, whether they admit it in this way or not, are sort of chasing um, the innovation that TikTok has brought to the space. Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, you even, you only need to look at like um, Adam Morezzi and, and what he came out with at the start of the year around the objects for Instagram. Yeah. And, you know, it's short form video, it's um, creators and rewarding creators uh, among the t- two of the main the main things that they're focusing on. And, and all the platforms are, are sort of moving in that direction. Even mm-hmm. the likes of YouTube, you know, the biggest video platform has obviously introduced YouTube shorts and is really pushing that side of things. So it, it, it's a really interesting space. Um, to answer your question, I mean... Uh, as I say, when I started, I think MySpace was there. Um, I mean, you know, a couple of years later, there was Facebook, yes. um, which is was a lot different uh, to what it is today. Um, you know, um, it was an exciting time, actually. Um, but I don't think anyone really knew. And it was like every sort of new innovation. There was people um, in the sector saying, this is the next big thing. Everyone yeah. watch out. Others sort of being more sceptical and then others in between and just watching what was going on. Um I think one of the big shifts, certainly from our perspective, um, with Facebook and now to Meta in terms of the parent company Mm -hmm. is um, the movement, you know, a number of years ago to more of an advertising platform and then the relevance that that started to bring for brands and uh, advertisers on there. Um, And even that's like an ever-changing space you know with uh, the ios updates that have come in and the tracking implications for that platform and therefore how brands are changing their view potentially around the value of advertising through through that and other platforms and then you know we await the sort of further uh, truck cookie changes and that are coming in next year which i'm sure everyone's bored of hearing about <laughs> but um you know th- this is sort of the implications but and then you know Meta have had a, a whole challenging period around privacy and uh, you know usership and or, um, share price going through the floor and all sorts. So um, and then you know meanwhile TikTok's forging ahead and seems to be breaking all new records and uh, you know um, it's like Facebook's really annoying younger brother, isn't it? TikTok or younger sister, <laughs> younger sibling. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I mean, I think. I mean, there's so much you could talk about. It could probably be a separate podcast, but I think the user base you've just alluded to there is one of the drivers. Um, 
I mean, TikTok is, is pretty much its own beast in that respect. But, you know, uh, for Meta, I mean, I think the data suggests that, you know, the fastest growing area is sort of the older, the older age group. You think about, particularly for Facebook, the relevance of it moving mm-hmm. forward as generations get older and perhaps are less used to using the platform. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, I think it just, uh, yeah, I think, I think it was that, it was that shift uh, over the more recent years to uh, to brands, and and that's what I'm worried about with 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 TikTok as well is is as they um, start expanding their their brand ad platforms and, and more businesses are, are using it. Like, what does that do to the the current user base and reach and uh, how how does that affect it? Because I, I feel like that was um, obviously made Facebook. A lot of money, but I, I feel like it's pushed towards ad content and paid content uh, really damaged uh, its user base. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a great point, um, particularly on TikTok at the minute. You know, all the data suggests people don't like to be sold to on that platform. Yeah, um, the most effective ads on the platform, um, which is an area that is accelerating quite quickly in terms of TikTok advertising, largely due to the value at the moment. Generally speaking, it. Uh, the, the cost is, is relatively low compared to other social media advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that the ads that are performing the best are those that basically look like organic content. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, a normal type of ad generally doesn't perform that well, general statement. So I think that sort of tells you what you need to know in that respect. So it'll be interesting from a user-based perspective to see how it goes. I think the appetite is there, though, to monetize the platforms from the platform perspective. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But... But what does that do? Like, what does that yeah. do to to the the creators and the um, and the users now? But you're right in in that it's it's that user gen content, isn't it? That that performs really well. But I, I don't know. I just I'm I'm really interested to see what happens. Like, uh, and and whether because the reach potential on on TikTok's massive. It's incredible, yeah. and and. Um, and to see whether that will drop off when they start pushing more and more ad content. Yeah. It's an interesting one. Yeah, uh, it is definitely interesting. I mean, the, the, one of the movements, and we've seen it with YouTube, and um, I believe Disney Plus is going to be going in this route. Uh, we await the Netflix potential advertising that the industry expects. Mm-hmm. But the subscription model is a route around it. Now, again, I don't necessarily think that will work for TikTok's user base because, you know, that younger, are you, are they really going to want to pay a monthly fee? Yeah. But that has, you know, other platforms have tried that. That's um, a good point. I haven't actually heard that. That's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, it's well, one, you know, it's tactic that YouTube have to remove the ads, I guess. Yeah, of course. Uh-huh. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's really cool. Uh, so... Can you talk about, I don't know, like, uh, I'm curious, uh, because you've worked with um, some, you've worked in and are currently working on with really big agencies, um, what are some of the cool clients that you've, um, that you've had, what, what are some of the brands that you've worked on, has there been like a favourite campaign that you've run? Um, well, I was thinking about the current client base, uh, Rugby League World Cup is one of our um, yeah, uh, better cool. known clients, shall I say. Um, one of the biggest uh, sporting events uh, in the UK this year. Um, it, there's four key city locations, one of which is Newcastle, which is great. Yeah. Um, big weekend planned for the launch weekend in Newcastle because it's England Samoa's the first game on October the 15th. And we expect from the information we have to hand that it's going to be very similar to like the Great North Run weekend. So there's like so much going on in the city, lots down the quayside. So I'm really looking forward to that moment of being like watching that game, being in the stadium, being like, oh my God, like we've helped create this. Yeah, that's uh, gonna, that's going <laughs> to hit you in a massive wave, I think, when that happens. That's incredible. Um, and to think, you know, um, whilst we believe we should be working on that, absolutely, um, to win a client like that in the first week of trading is, is you know, it's a cool thing. Um, I think it says a lot, doesn't it, about how much, how how much you and your team are respected in the industry mm-hmm. to 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 be able to get a client like that within the first yeah. 12 months of trading that's, that's amazing yeah uh, no appreciate that um 
so yeah we're really proud of that but we're also proud of our other clients I mean uh, um, when we work equally hard on them um, we've got a range across uh, quite a few sort of e-commerce clients Mm -hmm. uh, a a small number of B2B which is great as well a a different type of dynamic different type of approach need generally speaking need uh, quite a bit more strategy and consultancy which we very much enjoy uh so that's that's good fun um i mean you know uh in in terms of prior to bonded we've had the benefit of uh being able to experience working with some of the leading brands across multiple sectors really Mm -hmm. uh the likes of um jet 2 within travel and um you know we work with a couple of the big global banks um we've we've been part of the likes of Thomas Cook when that was um operating through our previous agency so I mean I could again <laughs> a completely different podcast I guess but yeah. you know I, I think it's good to have that experience and be able to say look you know I can confidently say that we've implemented strategies for some of the category leading brands and therefore you know we bring that knowledge with us for uh young and aspiring companies as well that want to become those brands and be as successful as them and you know we can bring that knowledge with us to say well actually when we were working on these types of brands this is the type of stuff that was working and yeah to have that confidence is, is a good thing I think so is the, do you think that there's um have you ever seen a campaign and thought oh, I wish I wish we'd done that has there ever been like a, a an ad or a campaign that an, another brand has done and you thought oh, that's really good I wish I'd thought of that one um, if I'm being, uh, I've never been asked that question before. It's an interesting one. Although, yeah, um, I would say if I was to um, critique our own ability at Bonded, you know, we're not a creative agency. We're not like, um, you know, we're marketers, so we we understand creativity. But I think it's a different type of skill set. And um, you know, when you look at yourselves and you're like, what are we good at? And we what what are we not so good at and what do we not want to profess to be good at because it's not um, being acting with integrity. You know, we would never say we're a creative first agency or or anything like that. So when, to answer your question, um, I do look at, you know, some really creative campaigns Mm -hmm. and say, you know, wow, that was a a really good one. Um, I mean, there is naturally sort of grey and blurred boundaries between how the two fuse. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, creative-powered media is... Uh, a really interesting area and, and even in the more traditional media channels the opportunity to be more creative is, has never been greater really um, and actually we were in a meeting this morning and we were talking about um, out of home as a medium for this particular company amongst others and we were referring to uh, some of the out of home campaigns that have taken place the likes of the takeovers by Gordon Gin, the Gordon's Gin in, in London where it wasn't just about the visual. They actually took over full tunnels in like underground stations, and yeah. uh, they fused it with like scents, so that you got the smell and the aroma of like the drink and stuff. I didn't. I haven't well heard of that one. That sounds incredible. Yeah. So it's basically bringing to life, like immersing, immersion, basically in the brand and bringing to life the different senses that you would experience. So, you know, that's pretty cool when you think about like just plain advertising versus actually uh, brand immersion and experiential. Yeah. And how the two cross over through media. Um, so, so I'd like I'd love to be able to do more of that. Yeah. Um, we, we we have done some, but uh, I, I'd like to do more and do more innovative campaigns in that respect. Definitely. Yeah, there's. I was at an event, um, and the founder of Grenade was there, mm-hmm. um, and she was speaking about um, one of the um, one of the sort of guerrilla tactics that they used where they, they drove a tank um, mm-hmm. to one of the supermarkets that they wanted to get into. And they drove it through the through London and just parked it outside um, because that, that was their brand, they called Grenade, and it was all to do with that. And I just thought that was um, incredible. And then when I think about like creative campaigns that have been running for a really long time as well, you, I think I, I always think of like um, spec servers mm-hmm. and their the recent mm-hmm. stuff where they're, they're... Have you seen it where they've got the... Um, the billboards or whatever and they've, they've put them on wonky or yeah. wrong and it should have gone to spec service I always think that that's um, yeah just an incredible uh, creative uh, yeah. thought process and campaign but it's been running for a really long time as well and it's still 
there's still new iterations of that uh-huh. same uh, campaign and that same brand, I think. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. I've seen a lot of the Specsavers stuff. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's great how they commit to that uh, from a strategy perspective. You know, that's almost created like an advertising brand for them, you know. Yeah, that, yeah. The, but when people see those adverts, like, well, certainly being a marketer when I see them now, you know, it's not shocking, but it's like, oh, this is the latest iteration. This is yeah. great sort of thing. So... Um, but I think, yeah, to your point, that creativity of like, how do you take from our perspective, like traditional media mm-hmm. and do it, fuse it with creative so it, it stands out essentially and it engages audiences even more effectively. That that really interests me. Yeah. I, and, and likewise, it, it, sort of on that, like, uh, where do you see, um, what do you see the future of? of marketing and um and what you do how how do you think that that's going to change over the the next the next couple of years because we've been through so much change so fast and you sort of you you mentioned it at the start as well about how fast um social moves and how fast that's changing and innovating um what do you see the future of this industry as (laughs) big question (laughs) um i'll try and still it down and be succinct um I think there are certain trends that are coming through in the next 12 to 24 months. Mm-hmm. Um, data and measurement is going to change. Um, not, not to sound too boring, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that is an area that is super important. You know, um, I think the implications for the industry in that area are, you know, first party data has never been so important. Mm-hmm. Uh, strong customer attention uh, approaches. Um, and for many areas of um, the they may look more towards like an acquisition and retention type uh, commercial modelling where, you know, I know that's not a new thing, but placing more importance, particularly for areas like retail where it's, you know, traditionally done on a, I spent this on advertising, what did I get from it? Yeah. But more of a, how much did it cost me to acquire that customer? And then, you know, what's the lifetime value? What, uh, how do I cost effectively retain that customer and encourage their loyalty and so forth? I think that's going to come through increasingly more. Um, digitally enablement, digital enablement will continue. Um, that's integrating increasingly more into traditional channels as well. So mm-hmm. we're seeing uh, an implementing activity across traditional mediums like audio and out of home, and uh, buying that media uh, on a digital, like programmatic basis. So what that means is we're able to get really granular with campaigns. And for instance, on uh, digital at home sort of buy by the hour you know versus a, a traditional way yeah. you'd have done it where you'd have plastered a poster on a on a site for like a month or, or longer mm-hmm. and not had the flexibility there um, to target things like you know commuter times around train stations and you know that type of stuff yeah. so that's that's really exciting like the granularity and the targeting that's going to uh, in- increasingly improve um, personalization so you know that's been talked about for a while in our space but I think that will continue um, there is a bit of a trade-off there because how that's usually powered is through data and uh, essentially platforms being able to gather data on uh, individuals and then personalize messaging to them um, naturally there's a big a big shift in the industry around privacy yeah. and a lot of the social platforms particularly under pressure around um, the data they're collecting and then we've got the change in cooking environment so that's going to challenge it um, but I think you know as marketers look to get more um, granular and targeted with their advertising mm-hmm. um, and driving you know stronger return on investments that's only going to uh, uh, increase I think and then um, f- going back to measurement, I think um, with the change in cooking, um, it'll be a really interesting space to see how um, I'm seeing increasingly more narrative. And, you know, again, this isn't a new thing, but around attribution and looking at, you know, uh, high, highly invested platforms like Facebook, mm-hmm. you know, they have what's termed in the industry like walled gardens still, where it's, you know, you've got their own platform reporting, but how do you build more of a cost-effective multi-channel view so that if you're spending X amount across multiple channels, accurately depicts, like, which channels contributing what to the overall outcome that you want to achieve? Um, so I'd, I'd look forward to seeing advancements in that area over the next couple of years as well. So, um yeah, there's loads going on. I mean, it's very fast-paced, and that's even without like the different platform developments and so forth. It's cool. It's really mm-hmm. interesting, actually, how um, 
how you're you seem to be really excited and focused on um on the technical and the data and mm-hmm. um and and how we how you use that to reach people and and like you said rather than um rather than sort of the the creative which i would like go to i'd be like oh well there's going to be these these uh new platforms and things and and that's what what i'd be probably or oh, like metaverse and all of that and that's oh, how yeah. it's going to, <laughs> but it, it's interesting to hear that you're excited by um by um, really digging deep into um how much information you can know which mm-hmm. is which is interesting yeah um i mean it's i really uh appreciate the observation i suppose again it's like i just take that as matter of course being based in our bubble (laughs) (laughs) but it is you know putting data at the heart is sort of how we uh, do business but you know in in terms of the creativity loads of loads and loads of interesting stuff and you know a lot of our clients traditionally when you work with e-commerce it's like uh, a lot of um, leaning towards like performance-based campaigns that we run so you know clients want to see an outcome which is usually growth and sales and new customers and things like that yeah Uh, we also love running you know more mid to top of the funnel activity that's more around uh, fusing creativity with awareness and and building brand visibility that's Um, what I love yeah that's my jam yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. um and you know, absolutely metaverse. I mean, again, that's probably a whole different podcast. But <laughs> yeah. um, who knows where that's going to go? But um, I, I find it exceptionally interesting, mm-hmm. um, and I try to keep on uh, on top of like the developments and read each week around what the latest thoughts are and so forth. We'll see. I mean, I know there's a number of brands ent- or have entered or are entering the metaverse and placing some level of investment in there. Um, and doing some cool like, brand activation stuff, actually. Uh, the likes of McDonald's and other bits and bobs, you know, I've seen. Um, when we fuse the two in our world, I guess, around, well, how will that actually impact on objectives around, you know, company growth and things? Mm-hmm. It'll be an interesting one, really. I think it will come down to, as platforms often do, you know, the usability and the uptake from, you know, the audience of the client, essentially, or the, or the wider uh, you know, more people that use it, the more opportunity there is to advertise, and therefore, absolutely. Uh, and and I think it's that balance, isn't it? Of um, for a lot of businesses, uh, waiting, it, it, they're waiting to see what will happen. Um, but sometimes getting there first is is a, a really big benefit, a big risk, but can have huge rewards. So um, it's definitely an interesting time right now in in our world. I would say, uh-huh, uh-huh. yeah really is um and like you say you know you look at brands like nike who have already put like big bets on and uh you know are trying to get in there mm-hmm. as category leaders into that space and mm-hmm. um yeah i absolutely agree it, it's just a really interesting phase i think to see what the movements from the different brands are and 100 um, percent. i think it's mad as well for um to have for, for people who have seen because the new generations now have, have sort of, this is what they know, and mm. they've, they've always had a phone and they've always had internet. But um, and and even in, in like I'm a millennial, and even millennials, uh, I mean, in the nineties we still saw internet and consoles and stuff like that. So we still had that technology. But prior to that, the people that have seen before all of that, when it was still uh, like a phone in a, a phone in your house, or when you're out yet you to go to a pay phone at the end of the street, or like. Just that world, I mean, it must be mad to, to look back at seeing it then without that hyper-connectivity to where we are now and the possibilities and how fast it's moving. That journey is incredible. Oh, amazing, amazing. I mean, I was one of the first um, people in my sort of friendship group to get a mobile phone, and it was a Nokia, <laughs> yeah. uh, as most of them were, I think. Um, and that was at university, so I think that was like 1998. 99 and like you imagine like it, like literally how did you know how did we used to live i don't know <laughs> I, 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 I honestly yeah. don't know i honestly don't know um i tell you what you know thinking about the metaverse i do think an area that i didn't mention in the trends but which is particularly of interest to me is um the fusion of uh like uh, digital with like offline if you guess and um how augmented reality and certainly virtual reality but yeah. augmented reality particularly plays a a role in that and i think that's an area that has been anticipated for a few years yeah. um 
and there are brands, particularly in the luxury space, actually, like so Gucci, who've done you know collaborations with Snapchat and looked at how um, they can have filters that show you how like a pair of their shoes will look on your feet yeah. and stuff. I think that fusion between uh, that multi-channel fusion is really interesting because I can see like the direct implications for brands that particularly in something like apparel where mm-hmm. you know if you can if it is possible to create a an experience where you can try clothes on without having to go to a shop yeah. and almost um reduce the uh, need to go to an offline store if that is ever going to be the case um uh you know that's hugely powerful for like uh v- virtual e-commerce and so forth so. yeah absolutely uh, I've never used I've never used anything like that either. I'd be really interested to see um, its capabilities now. But in the air as it grows, that's going to be that's wild. It's al- it almost makes me. It's, I'm I'm torn because I feel excited by the possibility and to see what happens, but then a little bit sad that we're we're losing uh, or it feels as though we're losing like that that real world um, uh-huh. and that tradition and traditional way of doing things. But um, but I suppose if that's all you've ever known, that's all you've ever known, yeah, isn't it? So yeah. I don't know. I, I'm always torn between, um, yeah, really excited and passionate about it, but then also uh, a little bit sad and nostalgic. <laughs> I, I think for me, um, I, I'd absolutely concur in a way. Um, I mean, if I was to succinctly summarise my view, it, it would be around connection. Mm-hmm. So, you know, thinking about that, that COVID scenario I mentioned, but I think as humans we've got a... Well, not everyone, but, you know, there is, um, we, you know, connection is generally an important thing for many, many of us. And that interpersonal being around other people, connecting, mm-hmm. you know, and that can only really be done in a certain way in a physical environment, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think there'll always be that need for sort of um, physical human connection, if you like, not to go too deep. And how that then plays out, I think there'll be boundaries around, you know, it will only go so far yeah. from uh, you know physical perspective. I mean, you know, you look at data, and actually within retail, um, although the grow- growth in e-commerce has been huge and accelerated significantly, particularly over the last two or three years, mm-hmm. you know, the percent that there's still a higher percentage of sales for retailers in the UK done through stores than yeah. there is on the internet. So, you know, that sort of puts it in perspective. And actually, the latest stats uh, from the last um, few quarters are that you know, traditional sort of come back up mm-hmm. in terms of um, the trading. So that, that, that'll be interesting. And, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see what implications there are for town centres, particularly those that perhaps struggle in a little bit more and yeah. have a lot of empty shops, whether there'll be a change away from the traditional retail model more towards like an entertainment or, you know, it'll, it'll be an interesting space, I think, over the next few years. Yeah, I think so too. I've really enjoyed this <laughs> and... Uh, actually don't want it to to end and I think you you actually said a few times um uh, that'll be for another podcast and I think I agree (laughs) yeah I think we I think it would be really cool uh um to do this again sometime if you'd be down for that 100% yeah yes always I really really enjoyed that um thank you for thanks for coming on and thanks for sharing sharing so much value and knowledge it's been incredible oh thanks Chloe no I really appreciate you your invite and thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it so very cool. Uh, so, if you want to, um, if you want to find Stephen, um, you can reach out to him on uh, the social platforms. Follow him on the likes of LinkedIn. Uh, Stephen Underwood. Uh, find his agency, which is Bonded Agency, on all of the platforms as well. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Um, so that's been the Beat the Squirrel podcast. Uh, thanks everyone for sticking around. Uh, it's been it's been incredible. I hope everyone got as much from it as I did. Um, really excited over the next couple of weeks. We've got some more incredible guests lined up, which is really, really cool. Um, really means a lot if you can leave us a review. Hit that bell button, subscribe, like, all of that good stuff, depending on which platform it is you are listening to this. And I guess... There's nothing left to say, but I'll see you on the next one. Bye.